Delight to be here. I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm going to be moderating this panel here on the future of media. I have a fantastic panel. You probably know all their bios in detail. But the thing I like most about everybody who's going to be on this panel is that they have all invented more than one thing. They've all done at least two extraordinary things. Tom Freston here, who helped create MTV, became a mogul, helped create Vice, changing the media in Afghanistan, a whole set of amazing things. Isaac Lee created all sorts of publications in Columbia, one of Columbia's most impressive, successful journalists, and has turned Univision into, I don't know, will probably soon be the most watched television network in the country on, on its current trajectory. Chris Hughes made a little thing, helped make a little thing called Facebook and is now reinventing the New Republic. So, uh, and Pat Mitchell, who will be here shortly, has had about 17 amazing careers. So let's go. Future of media. Let's start with you, Chris. And let's, um, let's talk about the reinvention of the New Republic. So you've got this magazine. It's made by Walter Littman a long time ago. You're trying to turn it into something new. You've got a man here, Tom Freston, who created Vice Magazine, which a lot of people talk about as the future of media. They've gone very aggressively into video. They've sent Dennis Rodman to North Korea. They have done all sorts of extraordinary things, both serious and fun. What do you think the New Republic can learn from Vice? Uh, I, th I mean, and I should mention I that I feel like you're going a little bit in that direction. I saw the shirtless photo of Netanyahu in the current issue. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, I think it's really difficult to talk about the future of media because media can mean everything from Netflix's House of Cards to the New Republic to the New York Times to Vice, et cetera. Um, so I, I think historically we've done that because there were only a, a few people who could create media. There were only a certain number of ways to produce it. But increasingly in 2013, the term, I think, is almost unraveled. Um, so I think that there are a few things that we're really betting on. Um, one is going very specific on a small group of people. For us, it's highly influential people who are interested in politics and culture. It's investing deeply in experiences rather than just access to content. So for us, that means picking up a magazine and going page by page. But in other uh, cases, uh, could mean a tablet experience, could mean um, good video, could even mean something like uh, Snowfall or whatever uh, other initiatives the New York Times in that vein is, is uh, working on. Um, so I think that that increased focus on um, a certain group of people and on a certain kind of experience um, is where we increasingly have to go. But I think that's not just something that's specific to the New Republic. I think it's um, what uh, most media companies are investing in. So how do you think people will be reading the New Republic in... I guess we're talking about 2020. In 2020, will I be reading The Republic in print or will I be reading it in my Google Glasses? You will probably be reading it in print along with uh, tablet, maybe Google Glasses. Um, <laughs> not as sure about that. Um, print's really strong for magazines. I think it's really different from newspapers. But um, we've done a lot of research around the, uh, these questions. And um, about 70% of our print subscribers also own tablets. But they still subscribe to it in print. Um, and it's, it, I think it's for a lot of reasons. The reasons that they say is that, well, it's just easier for me to lean back and focus on it in print. But I also think it's because I'm a big believer that print is a highly uh, undervalued technology. I mean, it is, uh, it's colorful. It's beautiful. In our case, it's glossy. It's light. It's disposable shareable. It's all of these things that we just sort of take for granted because uh, most of us gr uh, grew up with print everywhere. But um, it really has a, a, a shelf life that I think a lot of people uh, undervalue in the magazine industry. I think something like newspapers, it's much more difficult because with newspapers, they were always sort of rather unwieldy experiences in the first place where you, you know, got uh, 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 you know, stains on your hands, and it was hard to read on the subway. Um, so I think that the, the, the lifespan there is shorter. But um, I think print is, is alive and well. So one great advantage of print newspapers that I've discovered as someone with young children is that they absorb food coloring really well. <laughs> um, Tom, are these, the, uh, are these the right lessons? Let's talk about Vice. Are these the right lessons that uh, media should be learning from Vice? I mean, The New Yorker just spent 12,000 words describing your wonderful institution, media empire that you're building. What should, uh, what should other people be learning from Vice? Well, I don't know. Just a correction. I didn't start Vice magazine. I you sort helped of, turn it into what it is. It, you played it, a big it, role it, in that. It became a, you know, it's been around since 1994. And, uh, you know, it's been an organic brand. It's kind of developed. And as it's developed, the folks who run it have gotten more and more ambitious and really wanted to become sort of premium mm -hmm. video producers. 
And they've built up a wonderful audience. They've got a suite of websites. I mean, they basically are, it's a youth brand. It kind of skews male. And they, they are trying to, among other things, engage uh, younger people in the world of news and mm -hmm. trying to do it with their own spin. It's sort of non-celebrity, talking head driven. It's more immersive. And uh, they're, they've turned out to be really quite good storytellers. And they've mm -hmm. been at Absolutely. this for seven or eight years now uh, in terms of producing video. And on YouTube, where they have a channel that exists separate from their websites, they're the most engaging. I think people people tune in, an average tune of like 35 minutes. So mm -hmm. it's obviously resonating with the audience. They're a worldwide brand, and they you know take full advantage of the uh, the footprint of the internet, so to speak. They're in 34 countries. They've got offices all over the world. That basically, they started with their magazine going from country to country, and people kept sending them stories, and they started doing it. So they've got this great great sort of field of reporters out there that. Uh, feed them really interesting stories, and they're able to do it with their own, you know, twist and panache. Tell me what the Vice advertising model can tell the rest of media about how advertising and editorial content will interplay in the, uh, in the future. Well, in video, they're big believers that the, the world of the 30-second commercial, the interrupted television model, mm -hmm. interrupted video model, is going away. Right. Because of the DVR and on-demand and, and, and so many other things. So you need to find other ways to engage advertisers. And their, their strategy is to, you know, to do sort of sponsorship, what's called integrated marketing. They'll, 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 for example, they created a website, a separate website called Creators Project with Intel, where Intel was the sole sponsor of this website. And it just says at the bottom, brought to you by Vice and Intel. And they, this thing has like 17,000 contributors around the world. There's no display advertising or virtually none. And they're able to convince Intel and other large advertisers that they have some secret sauce for reaching this millennial audience that if, if Intel was looking, in this case, to appear to be somehow in the nexus of technology and, and art, uh, this was a way to demonstrate that. And Intel's, just in one example, quite happy to, you know, they're quite happy with the results thus far. So sponsorship rather than 30-second pre-rolls. Uh, greetings, Pat. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> We're delighted, delighted to have you here. We just started a minute ago. Um, Isaac, uh, I've been on a lot of media panels over the last couple of years, and there's one. I haven't. But there's a question that I have been dying to ask somebody, and I can finally ask you. What does it feel like to run a media company whose future looks awesome? <laughs> <laughs> it feels wonderful. <laughs> I mean, just some, some stats about Univision, so he doesn't have to toot his own horn. So Univision is growing incredibly quickly, has recently overtaken NBC, uh, is on a trajectory to overtake many of them. And there's a statistic that is stuck in my mind from a, a piece that um, we ran in The New Yorker that was partly about Univision, which is that of the 18 to 49 year olds who watch Univision, for 70% of them, it's the only channel they watch. Whereas for all of its competitors, its networks, 10% of them are as loyal to one channel. So changing demographics, um, loyal uh, viewership, it's, uh, it's a bright future. So tell me, tell me how many years until, um, until you're the most popular by, network in the country? By 2020, for sure. By 2020, for sure. <laughs> um, we, we are doing incredibly well. We are today a news department that not only is growing in ratings, it's growing in profits. And that's very hard to see in news, especially in network news. And uh, all of our news shows are growing compared to last year. We are very, very happy about that. But I think that there's something that, that we can make an analogy between Vice and us, which is hard to think of. And it is that they, they, they were not paralyzed by the success of the magazine. Mm -hmm. And they did not just stop at posting online. They, they uh, were very, very fast to get into video and reach an audience in a different way. And what I can tell you is that although we are doing amazingly well at Univision and we, we did beat NBC in prime time, uh, there are five different uh, markets, including Miami, LA, uh, New York, Chicago, where we beat GMA in the morning. Um, and and uh, our LA uh, television station is the number one in the country, regardless of language. Our average viewer is 10 years younger than the average viewer of the other networks. Um, we are not standing still. We are launching a new network called Fusion in partnership with ABC News to reach Hispanic millennials in English. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I, I think it's going to be a huge, huge success. And I'm still uh, 
amazed that nobody did it before. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that understanding the changing demographic of this country and seeing what is going on with, with Hispanics and knowing that one out of three babies that are born, uh, one is a Hispanic, that every year 500,000 Hispanics turn 18, um, that although we are only 60% of the population in millennials, we are 20, 21%. Um, and that they are completely acculturated, that their main language is English, that they were born here, they went to school here, they're part of the banking system, they're part of the political system. Uh, no one has thought how to reach Hispanic millennials before. Um, and that's what we are doing now. I think it's a very, very exciting project. Um, and that's it. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about the editorial content of Univision. So yes. it's... Um, there's a lot of hard-hitting stuff, and my understanding is that you were brought in to create more of that. And the, the bit we were writing about, a deep investigation of Marco Rubio, was clearly that. But it's also, it's seven hours a day of soap operas. How is the editorial content of Univision going to change over the next few years? Look, I, Univision has a great formula. Um, in terms of prime time, it has to do a lot with Televisa. We, we cheat. You know? We have a focus group the size of Mexico. They run the telenovelas there. They become really successful, and then we bring the best ones here, and we air them. So, you know, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, uh, and, you know, being a monopoly is not a good thing unless you are the monopoly. <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, I don't think it's going to change m much in terms of the novelas. I think Televisa is doing a very good job understanding the market. Um, and producing, you know, really, really good telenovelas. Um, the editorial content of the news department has changed a lot, substantially. We created an investigative unit. Uh, we are getting our first Peabody on Monday. Uh, we did Fast and Furious. Um, we created a documentary unit. We, we were able to prove to the company that the audience is interested in serious journalism. Our documentaries outperformed novelas. Uh, we're very, very happy about that. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what kind yes, of I mean, when, when we got there uh, and we, we produced our first, for example, an investigation about the influence of Iran in Latin America. It took us a year to do it, had a you know, large team of people working on it, and then it was all about the grid. You know, where is this going to be aired? And, there was a big discussion, and, and, and of course, they were very afraid to put it on prime time because you know, they do incredibly well. They have novelas, etc. And we convinced them to try. And fortunately for our project and what we had uh, planned for, it outperformed the novela that was in that place at that time in ratings. And the conversation in social media was amazing. It created congressional hearings, investigation. A consul of Venezuela was declared persona non grata, um, and it was news. And, and so, you know, we are able to, to, to also produce serious things for an audience that is eager to have, uh, you know, information. Um, I think that there are two very good examples, and, and it is on the presidential debates. Um, the people that in this city decided to uh, create a presidential debate commission um, did not think that it was relevant enough to include 50 million Hispanics as part of the conversation. They did not choose a Hispanic moderator. They did not uh, do anything in Spanish, but that's not the worst. Mexico was not mentioned. You know, o sea, we talk about Iraq and Afghanistan and all kinds of things. Um, we, we talk about uh, people's religion, but, but Mexico, who's right here influencing this country more than any other, it was not mentioned. Latin America, why? You know, well, so, so, you know, immigration is a, is a little side conversation. So we, we went to the presidential uh, commission, Nick, and asked them to, uh, you know, invite us to participate, to have Jorge Ramos there. Um, and they said no. So we did our own presidential forums. And in my opinion, our journalists were able to prove that they are more, um, you know, tough, serious, uh, and asking about the issues that our community c 
cares for. Well, I mean, you may have, you may have done even better than that in that uh, if the report in The New Yorker is to believe the Republican presidential candidates were so scared of having a debate on Univision that they engineered a scandal involving Univision so they could back out of it, but <laughs> we digress. Pat, welcome. Let's talk about uh, something that Isaac just said, which is paralyzed by successive magazines. Innovator's Dilemma. You have a very a product that people love. You're trying to change it into something new, but you don't want to give up the product that people love. So you have taken a museum. You have turned it into a center. You have taken something static. You have turned it into something live. What are the things you were worried about losing as you went through this transition? Oh my goodness. I thought you were actually talking about the beginning of my career, which was for a magazine, which well, for, promptly for went lucky, bankrupt right? and left me unemployed. Uh, which is why. It's an experience that many people in this room will have shortly. <laughs> <laughs> right, that was a long time ago, too. That was the first death of, um, of magazines in uh, 1969, to show you how long ago that was. Um, and, and that led to television. But, you know, a, an institution that serves the media, the, or that leads the conversation about media, can't be a museum. I mean, I'm constitutionally unable to run a museum anyway. I don't, <laughs> I, it doesn't work for me. Um, but it also doesn't work for an institution that really does need to be a place where the media industry gathers and talks about issues of mutual concern when they're not negotiating with each other. Um, a place that looks at what Isaac has just um, Describe so so well the the future of media and how it's being defined in, in entirely different demographic terms and uh, ethnic terms and all other ways in which uh, we as consumers are shaping new responses to that. So we we had to become a, a center because that is in in fact. So was there what anything we are. that as you made this transition was there any moment where you broke something and somebody who had been a loyal donor or somebody who had been a big fan said, hey, hey, you just broke that. That thing is great. What are you doing? Absolutely. You, you and cannot... so what was that thing that caused the biggest problem for you? Oh, well. <laughs> Have, were you in my boardroom? <laughs> uh, no, quite seriously. You can't make changes in any institution, certainly not one that's been around for a long time, as you know, right, Chris? No, no, no. Um, <laughs> you, you can't you can't do that without breaking glass. I mean, it's just and the thing you have to do with with your board and with your patrons and supporters is convince them that the broken glass is going to end up as a whole thing by the time you get to the end of the path of evolution. And so that that takes negotiating and taking smaller steps than maybe you would want to take. But I don't know how any of us who have anything to do with the media and technology landscape can do anything but move as fast as we can. Because no matter how fast we're moving, we're never going to move <laughs> as fast as the innovators <laughs> and the disruptors are. We had a, a gala this week, our biggest fundraiser, which Tom very happily lent his name to. Last year, we raised money off of him. This year, we raised it off AO AOL and Tim Armstrong. But the big event of the evening was that the people from Google came in wearing Google Glass. Well, forget that anybody else had anything to say <laughs> or anything to talk about because the whole entire evening we were all going over and saying, okay, so how does it work? And while they're staring at you with that thing, you're thinking, are they recording every word I'm saying? Um, so, you know, you can't, you, you really can't keep up as we've seen in the last few there days. There is a conspiracy theory that Google Glass actually doesn't work and doesn't do anything. It's just a way for Google engineers to get dates at parties, but that's <laughs> a minor uh, conspiracy theory. Well, it theory. certainly worked at the gala the, uh, <laughs> the other night. All right, so let's talk but, about... But it did bring up, just to, sure. pick up, um, to pick up on your point of how do you make the transitions, you pick the big issues and the big evolutions and you try and focus on those in a way that has some meaning to all of your constituents, the consumers of media as well as the people leading media and technology and data and the collection of data and what we're doing with it and how it's being collected is one of those big themes that we're really focused on this year because it cuts across everyone's interest from us as individuals to those big companies that are collecting it. Um, well, let's talk, about, let's talk about breaking things, Chris, and let's talk about the changes you've made at New Republic, and let's drill down a little bit. So from an outsider's perspective, it seems clearly you've massively redesigned the website. You've massively reduced the number of links, the number of stories. It's very much focused on one story. There's a big, big design change, make it easier to read long stories. It seems, and I may be wrong, that you become more of a general interest magazine and less of a political niche magazine. Tell me about the, 
the specific changes you've made and the things you've broken in the process that were most difficult to break? We changed a lot. Um, I think the biggest change that we've made or where the most glass was broken was moving out of uh, a category of generally ideological magazines that um, uh, the New Republic was traditionally grouped into the Nation, the Weekly Standard, um, the National Review, et cetera, and towards a group of magazines that is less about opinion journalism and more about feature writing. Hopefully it's The Economist, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, the set that you know, we are increasingly a part of. Um, and that's a big change for our institution. I mean, for nearly 100 years, we were doing opinion journalism. And by that, I mean oftentimes short pieces uh, where individuals who had a big idea, they had to go to the New Republic to print it because this was before the internet, before blogs, before Facebook, before Twitter. You had to have some outlet to, um, to, to share or express your opinion. Of course, in 2013, everybody has an outlet. We have tons of outlets. And so having, in my mind, having a journal that's, that's just devoted to political opinion didn't make a lot of business sense. And so we've massively shifted in the direction of feature writing. We've gotten rid of the editorial for the magazine, which is not something we take lightly. The editorial has been written for 98 years, 90, 99 years. Um, but it was part of another time where there's this omniscient narrator who has the opinion of the institution. Um, and, and while that contributes because it's an important opinion, it's, uh, I'd much rather have a half dozen opinions with different perspectives so that I as an individual can evaluate uh, uh, what seems true and what, uh, what, what doesn't ring as true. And so that shift is, is very um, important for us strategically, but um, is probably one of the biggest, uh, the biggest things that we've done. So Isaac, as you, you know, you're on a great part of your trajectory right now, but you also know that Soon you're going to get threatened by the same things that threaten CBS, NBC. You're going to get threatened by cord cutters. You're going to get threatened by you know, all sorts of the infinite you know, cable world. You're going to be threatened by a ton of things that have brought these people down. So what are you doing now to, to prevent that from happening? How are, you, how are you innovating to prevent the inevitable onslaught? We were so far behind that we, need, we needed to start with catching up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we uh, were not working in a nimble way, that we were not using the resources that we had to the best of our ability. Uh, we were not being very good in digital. Um, and and we, we did make one huge step. We took one huge step, which uh, was starting to do English language news. Right. You know, uh, to convince the company to, to let us do English language news was a big controversy. Because when a company is doing so well in Spanish, and he's by far the leader. Uh, there is a question of why are we going to get into a different market? Um, and how is that going to affect us? And, and so um, it, it, um, it takes a, you know, a brave CEO and a, and a very supporting board to let us get into projects like this one. Um, and, uh, and I think that we are now uh, uh, very well aware that, that for our young audience, the, the second screen is actually the first screen, and we are producing news content for them. We are doing a lot of short form. We are, are producing stories that are uh, for digital only, not working as a, as a news network department that thinks that has uh, a 30 minute uh, you know, block at 6.30 PM and then one at late news. Um, we, we are a 24 hour news uh, news department that uh, we are producing news for for our audience all the time and and also by realizing that for breaking news uh, social media is better mm -hmm. um, and that if we cannot come up with something where we can uh, give more context information uh, get in depth then we're not doing our job well um, and and not to try to compete with social media in breaking news because we, we saw what happened with a Boston uh, marathon bomb on how ugly it can get when television improvises. Um, and so, but also how ugly it can get when social media jumps ahead of itself. Oh, of course. 
Of course, I mean, to be a good journalist doesn't change much yeah. if it's on social media, if it's on Twitter, or if it's on a documentary. There are certain things that you have to do, like fact check, for example. Um, but but, but it, it is, there are tools that allow you to act much quicker uh, than what we were used to. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that we are doing that. But I don't think that we are where we need to be, uh, which is one very important uh, thing to be conscious of. Uh, but we are moving forward fast, and I am allowed to break things. So, so good. Well, let's talk about social media for a second. We have one of the world's uh, great experts on social media. Some of you may know um, Tom was fired from one of his previous jobs for not acquiring MySpace for $500 million, and uh, MySpace was just sold for $30 million. Um, so, Tom? Rehired? Of the, <laughs> of the social media sites that people are excited about today, Yahoo's maybe going to buy uh, Tumblr for a billion dollars. What should we not buy? What is going to fail? Show us the uh, insight that led you to see the demise of MySpace before everybody else. Well, the MySpace stories, I mean, we, we, we had some issues about its, its traction and yeah. where it was going. And we were still in negotiations with him. And, and, and Murdoch came in. And uh, he just bought it over the weekend. No due diligence, anything. So a first rule would be, if you're going to buy something, Look into the business Back a little check. bit, lift up the hood, <laughs> and, uh, and check it out. I mean, it, it's, it's hard in the, uh, you know, it, it's hard to think if you were looking to buy an online property, if, first of all, if you're an established media company. It's very hard to think of almost any instance where any established media company has bought a digital property and it's really paid off, mm -hmm. that, that has been successful. It almost hasn't happened. Almost, you, know, you can start with AOL and Time Warner is one of the worst examples, mm -hmm. although, of course, the purchase was the other way around. But, right. uh, so I don't, I don't know as if there's a magic formula. Uh, it seems, though, that... Uh, I mean, bought Reddit. That actually has worked out really well for us. Yeah, Reddit. And there's been, you know, there's been some small things like ESPN's bought some little sports, yeah. some, uh, sports sites that kind of fit into your existing business that right. can work. But, you know, there's usually cultural problems and uh, you're inheriting someone else's things. The, the things that have really been wonderful in the digital age have sort of been the organic things that have started small with a, with a strong vision and have prospered over time and kind of grown step by step. And, and the focus has been more on the user experience and how do you monetize it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know... We have a lot of great examples of that out there today with uh, Facebook and so on. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, what the answer is if you're looking to buy something. I was looking for the opposite. I was looking. Oh, to, what, what you're looking? I'm looking what not to buy. I, I wouldn't buy most things, uh -huh. probably. <laughs> I mean, not that I'm on the market to buy Tumblr at the moment, but I'm just curious for the audience's sake. Uh, I, I don't. I really, you know. I think mostly everything you're going to look at in the digital space is probably going to be something you're not going to want to buy, unless it's a direct fit with what you're already doing. And it kind of fits in, and you think that culturally this thing is going to play out, and that, and that, you, and that you're not going to have to cram uh, all kinds of uh, advertising or whatever down the throat of what you just purchased to make it uh, pay off in the minds of investors that you're also having to serve. Yeah, I, I would add that one of the things we're doing at the Paley Center on a regular basis now, which is not only informative about what you should buy and not buy, but also just how much is changing and how fast. The series is called The Next Big Thing, mm -hmm. and four or five entrepreneurs get the chance to pitch their ideas in five minutes, and then they get grilled by um, some people in social media who really know a lot about running those successful companies. And it's really interesting to watch the appetite in the room because it, the room includes venture capitalists, advertisers, other media companies, and some alliances are made. And I could, you know, name a couple of companies that, that actually got launched, but I could also name 22 that maybe aren't even in business now. So uh, you, you do have to move caution, not, not be attracted by every bright, shiny new thing. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of new big things coming up uh, on a daily, weekly basis, and we're seeing them. Well, I, if we're on this topic, we ought to, we, we fortunately happen to have somebody on this panel who created one of the brightest and newest and shiny things and then left it mm -hmm. to run one of the oldest and coolest and wonderful magazines. How should old media think of uh, social media? Should we view it as a threat? Should we view it as an opportunity? What? Give me some uh, depth on how it should be approached, uh, every, how everybody else on this stage here should approach um, all these great things that you've helped create. Um, I think, I mean, just the way you phrased it in the question is really useful. I think it is, um, in many ways, 
an enormous opportunity, but also threatens the way these businesses work. It's an opportunity because it's so much easier for established brands to reach new markets than it's ever been before. I mean, at New Republic, for instance, we have a 99-year-old brand. Nearly 50% of our traffic comes from social, which is enormous for us because it means that you know, a brand that in many ways had, had atrophied over time, we're able to take it out to market and, and expose people who haven't really seen it in the past few years without us trying to acquire email addresses or do paid media or any of that type of work. So there's an enormous opportunity there. A, a big downside, for, I think, for us as a society with social media, and it's something that I'm increasingly concerned about, is the bubbles that it puts us into. I mean, Eli Pariser had a book a few years ago called The Filter Bubble, but the idea, I think, has become increasingly concerning even since he published it then. And the basic idea is that it's easier and easier for us to live in our um, own little worlds uh, because of the increasingly specific nature of social media and our ability to configure our own filters. So I can go on Twitter all day and never see anybody that I disagree with. I can go on Twitter and I can, and, and, or on Facebook, and I'm much more likely to click on headlines that are, that are clever, regardless of what kind of content it leads to. Um, and then it just in general, we can see the content that moves on social media is often emotional, is um, ideological more often um, than not, um, is clever. And we work within that paradigm. I mean, it would be one thing if we said, well, this is just a lot of people who are just tweeting emotional things. We can't work in that realm because we're high quality journalism. Instead, we say, okay, this is the way uh, the internet works in 2013. How can we adapt to it? And so we have done journalism, particularly over uh, the past couple months, where um, it's just one quick case is uh, we did a story that was um, about a group of people who saved these texts in Mali that were hundreds of years old in the midst of um, the coup just over the past few months. And if you read it, I mean, it really reads like an Ocean's Eleven for book lovers. It, it is just a nail-biting story of people whose families, you know, they take the books to the basement, they hide them, they cover them, they put them on boats, they ship them down the river, and as a result, the texts were saved. You read this story, it's several thousand words long, but in the process, you learn about everything that's happening and ha has happened in Mali, and you also see from our internal analytics using Chartbeat that the time on site for that piece was like nearly four minutes. Over 50% of people on the site got like 2,400 words in, mm -hmm. which, you know, for those of us who count words, is really far into the story. Um, and it dominated our uh, traffic for days. Um, so it's not that, you know, I, I don't think that the right response to the environment that, that social media creates is just to to you know, put up your hands and say we can't deal with it, but it does challenge us to think about the journalism that we do, and we have to adapt um, towards it, even if um, it does prevent some of these, um, there are some of these almost perverted incentives for what gets clicked on more often than not. Ocean's Eleven for Book Lovers is an awesome tweet, and I'm gonna find the story and tweet it out with that line Credit tonight. Credit my editor, Frank Foer, for that. <laughs> it's not my original. Isaac, so not that long ago, you were a 25, 26-year-old uh, journalist in Columbia, starting things, creating things. There a lot of young journalists here out right now. Give some advice on if you were to start a new media company, if you were 26 years old and what you wanted to do is to start a media company that was going to blow up, what would you do and what would it be? Go to Brooklyn and visit Vice. Uh, you, <laughs> you would be very impressed. I was there yesterday. Um, and it is amazing to see how one good idea um, can, can get to a tipping point where it really explodes. Um, and it's all about uh, reaching people with authenticity. I think that is what they do best. And, and when we study what millennials want, um, they are very tired of things that are very, that are um, overproduced. They do not want people to read the news or reporters to tell them what they have to think. They want a, a frank, transparent, direct conversation. They want things to be funny. Uh, I, I find that humor is a huge currency for this generation. If you go and see Facebook pages, they're all trying to be funny and, and tell jokes and send videos. Um, so I think that there are very good examples out there to follow. Uh, but, but more than anything, I think that it's important to, to not be afraid, to know that the 
possibility of success is, is very, very slim. So if you're going to create something new, do it with your own ideas, convinced of what you are doing in a unique way, uh, instead of trying to copy some other people because that is the only way to fail for sure. Um, and uh, and um, the other thing that I have to say <laughs> that it, 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 it's supposed to be very obvious, but it's not, is that this is not a country where you will only find white males consuming news. Uh, this country has changed, and uh, it's not only the news that change, it's all culture changes, uh, because the demographics of this country, what is making the fiber of the United States today, it's completely different. So if you're trying to communicate to um, an audience that, I, I mean, I remember when the president went to Mexico a couple of weeks ago, if you would check the most important news outlets and what they had on their um, homepage, the trip to Mexico was not there. Um, and, and so I don't know how can they disregard the fact that, uh, you know, there are 50 million Hispanics, 80% of them are Mexicans, Latin America is important, the border is the biggest, trade with Mexico is, you know, the most important one for this country. The president is there, and we are focusing about things that are completely isolated. And it's what Chris is saying. You can actually uh, read only happy news and believe that the world is all going to be okay and things are wonderful and nothing is going on uh, with the environment or with the uh, endangered species just by how you filter your Facebook and your Twitter. So. Um, to, to, to stop and realize that this is a new country and that the identity and the DNA of the United States today, it's a different one, is very important to be successful in anything you do. So uh, speaking of Vice Magazine, I went on the site just a little while ago to see what the most recently posted videos were. And number one was from the Free Syrian Army, which was fascinating. Number two is from Mauritania. And number three was Scum Dad's Fat Jew's new web series where he does drugs in front of a baby. Um, I just so, read that one on my way down here today, actually. <laughs> so do what Vice is doing. Uh, I want to go to audience questions, but before I do that, uh, I, I want to A, call on Pat and then ask another question. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't I, say I, do what Vice is doing, just to be, you know, <laughs> say, go and look at that experiment because it's working yeah. really well. It's, very, it's, it's amazing. I, I would just add to this um, look at um, what's changed and how demographically, uh, certainly, Isaac, you make the big point. But what, if you look at media and technology and, and you look at the stories being told, the news being reported, and you look at the main actors and, um, and people behind the scenes of the entertainment program, you'll still find there's a huge population unrepresented. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it's the largest population of media and technology consumers. And that population is? Women. So, let me ask so you a follow-up. It's just astonishing to me that, you know, we look at this landscape of thousands of options of every possible uh, kind of content and story to consume, and you still have the hardest time finding those that appeal, particularly to educated uh, women. Now, having said that, an interesting new study is really should be of great concern to all of us. And there is a new digital divide in this country, and it is between educated women who get most of their news, including their political news, their consumer news, their what's going on in the world, their global news from social media. But 20, the less than 24% of high school graduate women of all ethnicities. So there's an educational barrier that is creating, a, a, and social media use, that is creating a different kind of digital divide. I would just add, at the root of a lot of this, this, this senseless exclusion of huge audiences is the fact that most of these companies are much more undiverse than the general population. Exactly. I mean, the percentage of African Americans, Hispanics, women, it, uh, I mean, for example, in the movie business, it's almost zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you go into the television business, particularly the older line networks, it's not much better than that. So, right. 
there's no reference points that these people have other than, you know, looking at each other and putting on what they like. I, I just came from the White House and I had a meeting on this subject of women and girls. And I told them we, we need to seriously look at the hiring practices of media and technology companies. Uh, to your point, Tom, and we also need to look at the regulatory policies because we backed off all of them. I mean, there, when I got my job in television because this country had quotas. How many of you knew that? In 1968 to 1970, there was an Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which required that if you operated a media company, you were operating in the public interest, and therefore your public interest needed to reflect the entire public. And so you had to produce a list at the end of every year of minorities and women that were hired during that year. And the face of television and the voice of radio changed in those years because the government said, we're not going to leave it up to you. You leave it up to business and you'll be where we are now with less than 7% of all broadcast and, and cable licenses held by women, less than 7%. Less than 5% of the clout jobs that you're talking about at the decision making um, top. And why does it matter? Well, it matters because the you know, we learn from the stories we tell. We 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 are informed consumers or not, and s largest number of of media consumers in this country of all media and technology uh, are women. And then you have to look at what we're telling our our girls and our boys uh, in the roles and what they actually see in media too. So there's a big gap still remaining, and unfortunately, with social media is getting larger. Isaac, you want to comment on that? Yes, Nick. I was just thinking that there are two departments that need to cease to exist in media companies, diversity and digital. We, we all have them, but if media companies do not understand that they need to be diverse, but not, not a department, the whole company, and they need to be digital, they are in big trouble. Right. That's a great point. All right, well, on that note, let's, uh, let's move to uh, audience questions. So raise your hands, ask some questions. And if there are no questions before I count to three, yes. Can you just, I didn't totally oh wait, microphone is coming. Uh, we are being uh, live streamed, so please speak into the microphone so that everybody can hear around the world. Can you repeat that study, the digital divide among women? Can you? Yeah, you know, I'd lo I wish I could think of the name of who did it. It was presented today. Can I get it to you? Because. Um, can you just say again what yeah, it is? I, I didn't understand it came what it from was. The opportunity challenge. And what's the divide exactly? Oh, the uh, level of education. That college educated women are getting their news. 42% of them are getting their news from social media, whereas only 22% of high school graduates and below are. And that this is a divide that they've seen growing over the last five years. That educated women are, are getting more information from social media, which is where uh, a lot of us go. I should get you the details of it. I believe it was the opportunity challenge. We had a whole- You should tweet it out tonight at NAS 2020. I will, because there were really some very interesting you got it? new research. All right, it's presented. going out over the internet, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, right here. Thank you. Um, this is to anybody who wants to have a go at it. Um, I recently saw Vice, and indeed, it's a powerful sensory experience. Uh, the particular <laughs> segment I saw was was about child soldiers, but it it made no attempt at putting the plight of child soldiers, how they got to the to the horrible place where they were. They were child soldiers were de depicted as as just really vile killers. Um, nothing about how they got to be child soldiers, how they'd been abducted by this uh, heinous criminal named Joseph Coney, and nothing about uh, their future, what, what lies ahead for them when they're no longer child soldiers, and, and do they have a future indeed. So, so that, Tom, would be my only criticism. It was brave footage and, and, and extraordinarily authentic, all of that. But, uh, but left me uh, shaken <laughs> without, without any, uh, it was, it was, there, there was no attempt to, um, to really inform. It was just pure, your, your gut In shaking. your face. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I've seen that particular piece, Kati, but uh, I will say, you know, they, they, they make a lot of news. They have a lot of producers. They, and, you know, every piece that they do isn't, 
you know, totally comprehensive, hitting every particular button. It's quite often it's the uh, it's 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 the narrative sort of from the mind of the producer. So. Yeah. When you talk about child soldiers, there's a lot to talk about, and obviously there's a lot of graphic, sensationalist footage, which I gather they had some in there, but uh, I, I can't believe that the piece was totally without any context. I don't know what the point was from this particular one, but uh, I mean, they'd be the first to say, look, we're not uh, state-of-the-art serious journalists. We're basically started as an entertainment company. We do news because we know that, increasingly we know that young people are interested in this. We're trying to get better at it themselves, ourselves. Uh, they're not totally objective, uh, but they do it in a way and in a style, uh, you, you know, in, in a less formal way that you see in most broadcast networks and news networks, and it, and it seems to resonate with the audience. But they'd say, look, we make a lot of things. Everything's not going to be perfect. Tom, we spent a lot of time talking about your involvement in Vice. Why don't you quickly tell us about uh, what you've helped build in Afghanistan, too, since that's also a major part of your media life. When I was uh, younger, I lived in Afghanistan before the, the wars that started in the, in, in the late 70s. I lived there for a bunch of years, so I had a connection there. And I've gone back there since I left the job at uh, MTV Networks and Viacom and worked in the television business. And it's not often you can find a country that had no television, a totally virgin market. But here you've got a country that was essentially cut off from the world, cut off from each other. The Taliban eliminated what small amount of television that there was. And um, one of the great success stories that's happened over the last 12 years or 10 years in Afghanistan has been the development of television and communications. And it's sort of embedded in their constitution. Consider they had 10,000 phones, 10,000 landlines when the Taliban were overthrown in 2011. There's now 20 million cell phones in a country of 30 million people. So they're sort of connected to each other into the outside world you know, really for the first time on that basis. There was no television, there was no radio. Uh, now there's 75 TV stations, 120 radio stations. They are embedded into the Constitution as being independent, and they've been the biggest platform for social change in this country. And, uh, you know, this is a country where the median age is 17. It's the second youngest country in the world. Imagine that. They've been in war for 35 years, and the average person is 70, 50% of the people are under 17. Uh, there's been great gains in this country that had kind of go underreported because the focus has always been the coverage that we see on the military situation in Afghanistan, whereas some of the changes that have rippled through this society that's increasingly urbanized, now about 50 percent of the people live in cities. Uh, there's a lot of gains that have been made in terms of life expectancy and whatnot, but the media, um, which was, didn't take a lot of money to get going. The, the station that I work for, we have like a 65 share. and It's sort of a general entertainment network. It does 17 hours of programming a day, big news, a lot of news coverage. People are really interested in the news in Afghanistan. It makes a big difference. But in terms of gender equality, you know, just imagine just having a man, a man and a woman sitting next to each other uh, giving the news sends big signals to people. Gender equality, your desire that your children to go to school, particularly your daughters, just basic literacy and education. Seventy percent of the people are, are illiterate. Sesame Street, which we run a Afghan, a, a Dari language version of, 50 percent of the audience is over 20 years old. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they watch it to learn how to count and speak. It's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, the willingness for a, a woman to be uh, beaten by their husbands, very really basic things, family size, uh, all of these things have rippled with great changes through the country. And it, to, to, what it says to me is that it's very unlikely that the Taliban is just going to march back in when we leave in 2014 and take over the country because the population, the psyche of the population, has shifted so much. In fact, I just spent a bunch of time there talking to young Afghan professionals who are from the private sector, work at ministries. They talk about the Taliban as if this was some group from the Stone Age that's just, you know, they just have had it with them. And they've, they've moved past. They're ready to get on with their lives and join the world. And I think it costs like a million and a half dollars a year to keep a Marine on the ground. We spend $10 billion a month in Afghanistan for the military. You know, I hope when we pull out that there's going to be some money and uh, whatnot in supporting the private media, which has been a great success there and really has given these people for the first time a window into the outside world so they can see where they stand and they've learned an awful lot. They have identified the media organ only media organization growing faster than Univision. Um, <laughs> is that Zachary? All right. Admittedly, this question is far less consequential in the greater scheme of things than how tens of millions of Afghans do in the future. That being said, it is a panel about the future of media, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, 
You know, there's a vast amount of opportunities if you are young, if you want a job creating content, if you want to be a junior producer, you can earn, you know, a good living if you're in your 20s or early 30s. There's a huge gap now in terms of the profession of what do you do in that more senior role? You know, you want to have a family, you want to support. What are the economics of this world going forward where there's a lot of okay paid opportunities at kind of an entry or young level, but there's an entire sort of broken down economic system that has yet to be replaced by something else if this is something that someone wants, certainly relevant to New America as a career? I think there's an easy one. I, I actually think that um, we've done a lot of growth and expansion at the New Republic. We've doubled the editorial staff over the past year. And one of the trends that we have seen is that um, a lot of the se more senior editorial staff that fit the description that you're making um, the market is still really strong for those talented individuals because in many cases they have really well-developed networks um, and they have reputations that um, consumers know and sort of uh, have a connotation of, of, of trust with. And so if anything, I'm more concerned about, I think we may flip on where I'm concerned from a economic standpoint. I think it's harder and harder for you know, people in there uh, who are just beginning their careers in journalism to find a foothold because, you know, there are a few very, uh, you know, entry level sort of reporter um, jobs at some institutions, but more often than not, you're forced to freelance. And in freelancing in 2013 often means getting paid very little money to publish um, digitally. And so a lot of those folks get run out of the profession. The ones who've been writing for a really long time, I think, at least in our space of, you know, particularly political and cultural news, um, between Bloomberg's entry into the market, Politico's, um, you know, strengthening role, and obviously some of the institutions that have been around for a long time, those, um, those jobs in that top end of the market seems um, much more insulated than, than the other side or than the younger folks. You guys want to comment on this one? I'm just really um, touched to hear it because I, I see this with my own children. How old are you, by the way? I mean, just vaguely. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, within ten years. How much do you weigh? Yeah, yeah, that's that's vague and good, <laughs> because that's the age group that I have a I mentor um, a lot of young men and women in that age group, and I have children in that age group, and they have found exactly what you're describing, that they had great, wonderful careers for the first ten years, um, generally in new companies and working for not a lot of money, but got to do innovative and creative work, and have now hit that kind of wall of um, there aren't as many jobs in that middle place. And Send them our way. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> just, just like, got a wonderful all right. opportunity. Speaking of hitting a wall, I have promised that I would end this on time. It is now time to wrap this up, so thank you. We have a fantastic panel, a great conversation, and we are out of here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good job, Nick.